Welcome, Alice. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. I feel like I should call you Mrs. Hoffman. I have like so much respect for you. I feel bad just calling you Alice. I know. Please call me Alice. <laughs> um, well, I'm delighted to have you on my podcast. Um, I was actually secretly thrilled when you followed me on Instagram. I was like, oh my gosh, Alice Hoffman's following me. So anyway, it's a, it's a thrill. Um, so welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Um, and congratulations on your latest book, Magic Lessons. Yeah, At this point in your career, do you do you even get excited when a new book comes out? Like, what's it like when a new book comes out when you've already written so many books? I more get anxious than I get excited because if, you know you're with the book by yourself for so long, and then it goes out into the world, and it's kind of like sending your kid to school or something like that. You know, you lose control, and you don't know what how people are going to like that kid of yours. You know. And so, you know, and then once it's out, then it's fine. But it's, it's just more like those, you know, the week before the week of, of, of its first being out there, it, it's anxiety provoking. So do you, do you feel any better at this point? Are you like yes, calming? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad I caught you on the, on the down. <laughs> <laughs> um, would you mind just telling uh, listeners a little more about Magic Lessons and why you chose to write a prequel to Practical Magic at this point? Yeah. Well, I, I wrote Practical Magic, the original book, 25 years ago. Right. And I never intended to write any more about that family, but I kept getting notes and letters from readers that they really felt like it wasn't enough, that they wanted to know more. And, but instead of going forward in time, I'm more interested in going back in time. So the first thing I did was write a book called Rules of Magic, which took place in the 1960s, because that's kind of my era. And I, it was like a pleasure to write about it. And then when I thought about writing another book, because I kept getting letters and I thought, I really wanted to see how the family originated. I'm always interested in, I guess uh, there's, a, there's a theory of like ghosts in the nursery. You know, mm -hmm. those relatives that you've never even met that influence everything about you and your life. And I wanted to go backward in time and, and see who the, who the first Owens woman was. Wow. And by the way, my husband and I listened to this um, well, we started listening to it in the car together, and our last name is Owens. And when <laughs> and so oh, we started, it started the narration, and we were looking at each other like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, maybe you're related. But maybe. I have to say, the recording is great at Sutton Foster, who I'm, I'm yes. a fan of hers. She was in Younger, and she's just a great theater actress. And so it's, it's a wonderful recording. I just had um, Pamela Redmond on my podcast, who wrote Younger. So it's like all coming full oh, really? circle. Yes. Oh, <laughs> Um, yes, it was an amazing recording and um, very captivating. The drive flew by. <laughs> okay. um, um, so that's why you, so, but why write it now? Like why at this point? Like you could write any book, right? At, like what's it like when you sit down and you're like, what's my next project going to be? How come you arrived at this today? You know, I don't know if I think about it that way because I have like a list of projects. Okay. So things that I'm interested in doing, books that I think I'm going to write. So it was kind of sitting there. And I just thought I had a lot of fun writing Rules of Magic. And I, so I wanted to get back to that. I kind of wanted to escape. So I felt like this book could be an escape for me as a writer. And I think it is in some ways for readers. Um, this is such a difficult time. And I felt like I wanted to go back to this other time and escape into magic and um, escape into this family. But as it turned out, a lot of things um, that had happened in the 17th century had a correlation to what is happening right now in terms of how women are treated and you know the idea of strong independent women being feared and um also i, I didn't realize it took place you know during and after the plague in england and so as i was writing it it was just very strange that that the world seemed not that different I was helping my daughter study for an American history test last night and I was reading through the things and I was like, actually, this is very similar to the Black Lives Matter movement that's going on right now. I'm like, you know, there are protests like across the street, they're pro this is what they did then. And anyway, it's funny how things sort of ebb and flow in cycles. Um, they really do. It, it, was, it was really interesting to me, but also the whole idea of the Puritan mentality. I mean, the Puritans were the ones that started the witchcraft trials here, although there were mm -hmm. witchcraft trials all over Europe. And the idea that women were kind of at the root of all evil. It's kind of the idea of Eve bringing evil into the, into the world. And it was really kind of shocking, their, their whole philosophy. And a little bit scary because there's a little some of that happening right now. 
Yeah. I was going to say that's not completely gone. I would think for no. some people's, you know, imaginations or whatever you want to call it. <laughs> and what, why do you think witchcraft, I understand what you're saying about women in general, but what is it about the sorcery, like the witchcraftiness of it? I mean, you have like lists of ingredients and what all of these things do, which you must have researched, I'm assuming. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. So like, what is your fascination with it? I have always been fascinated with witches. I mean, I am, a, I was a fairy tale fanatic as a kid because I felt at that point when I was a kid, I felt like it was the literature that spoke the truth in a very deep way, an emotional truth that other other children's literature didn't at that time. I still I still think it's the most deepest psychological literature, especially when you're a child. But I feel like witches, they are the singular, the only female mythic um, creature. You know, they're the only mythic um, creature with power. And I think that's why, you know, as a little girl, I always wanted to dress up as a witch. I always wanted to read about witches. I just felt like they had power. Well, there you go. I, it's funny because I never really thought of witches in such a positive way until this whole experience with you. <laughs> well, good. <laughs> yeah, and I think... <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. I think the idea of, of midwives and healers, I mean, I think that's all kind of under the same label as, as witch, you know, mm -hmm. that, you know, women who, who do things they're not supposed to do. And um, I thought it was so interesting that during, during the plague um, that women who, who did herbal remedies had a bigger success rate than doctors, mostly because they washed their hands. And that was just kind of so interesting to me. That is interesting. It's something I try over and over to teach the kids, you know? <laughs> I mean, yeah. this, this is like of the moment, the most important thing. Um, what about like mediums today? Do you feel like they're in the same family as the witch or you think it's like witch adjacent or? I think the witch is more mythic, more nature, has more to do with like kind of green magic, nature, herbs, healing. Yeah. I mean, that's how I kind of perceive it. But I have to say like in fairy tales, um, I, I can't remember the exact statistic, but something over 90% of the um, of fairy tales have girl heroes, which is very unusual in, in folk tales or in, in, in any story, really. It's that in fairy tales, the girls are the ones that figure things out. The girls are the ones who are kind of at risk. And I always feel like they're cautionary tales, you know, like the stories your grandmother would tell you, you know, to beware of certain things and to know certain things. Speaking of at risk, um, let's go back in time to your career trajectory here. Um, you, first of all, can you just tell me a little more about how you got started? I mean, I know I've read about it, but if you could just tell me the story of how your passion for writing translated um, in such a unique way into becoming a writer. Well, you know, I never thought I'd be a writer. I was a reader. So I was a fanatical reader. And but I was a secret writer, as I think many people are, especially girls. So I had, you know, stories and notebooks that I never showed anyone. And then when I was about 16, for some reason, I wrote a story and I sent it to Esquire magazine. I had never seen Esquire magazine. I just heard of it. I, you know, I'd never read it. And I sent them a terrible story about the end of the world. It, it, I didn't use any capital letters. And I got back a handwritten note from somebody who said to me, you know, you should use capital letters and grammar, but also if you have another story sometime and you're not kidding around, send it to us. And I was in shock. It was kind of like this thing where suddenly I was in touch with the outside world and somewhere, someone at this mythical magazine thought I was a writer. So I think that stayed with me and I kept writing. You know, I never intended to go to college. I, I you know, I lived in a very working class world. And I, I started going to college. I went to night school and then I applied to, my brother lived in California and said there was a really good school out there. I should apply and then I could move to California. And I'd never heard of the school, but I applied and it was Stanford and they, they gave me a fellowship. And it, I had a great mentor and it just totally changed my life. I mean, I feel like sometimes you have this one teacher that just changes everything. And uh, my teacher was Albert Gerard and he, sent my first story to um, City College to a magazine that they had called Fiction. A friend of his was the editor and it was published. 
which was a shock. I mean, there's no money involved. You know, I, I don't think people became writers to make money or anything back then. And um, after the story was published, I got a letter from a very famous editor named Ted Solitaro. And he said, do you have a novel? And I wrote back and I said, I do. And I started writing it that day really fast. And I think that's why I'm a fast writer because I just felt, I don't know if this guy's going to keep his job or what's going to happen. I better write this novel fast because no one's ever going to ask me this again. Wow. So how long did that book take you? Six months. But it was terrible. It was terrible. But I, I, you know, he helped me with it. And in the end, he didn't take it, but he sent it to my agent. And I feel like it was just, you know, it was luck. But also every time somebody opened the door, I walked through. And, you know, I didn't say, I don't know, I don't have a novel or it might take me two years. I just felt like this is my chance and I'm taking it. That's great. Wow. And so, and you don't have the same agent, do you? I, I was my agent until she passed away. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. We were, she was my agent for, I think, 40 years. Oh, I'm so sorry. I was, lucky. I was really lucky. She was great. Her name was Elaine Markson and she was an amazing agent. Um, I also noticed, um, you started the Hoffman Center for Breast Cancer Research. Is that yeah. right? So yeah. I just wanted to find out more about, um, why you started that and what that whole initiative is about. Well, I'm a breast cancer survivor of 25 years. And, um, when I was being treated, um, at Mount Auburn Hospital, which is a Harvard teaching hospital, a small hospital, they didn't have a breast center. So while you were waiting for radiation, you'd be sitting next to someone who had broken his arm. Or once I sat next to Gina, my wonderful dog groomer, it's just like, there was no privacy. And I think when you're going through treatment for that, you need something special. So when, when I finished my treatment, I asked some of the doctors over there, you know, what could I do? And they said, let's start a center here. That's what you can do. So for 25 years, almost, maybe it's more like 20 years, um, we've been doing an event every spring with, with, with where writers come and read, and we have had incredible writers, everyone from Amy Tan to Celeste Eng to just, just so many amazing people who have given so generously of their time and created the state-of-the-art breast cancer center. So I'm really proud of being involved with them. I want to get on the list. <laughs> that put me on the list for the benefit. Um, that sounds great. I'm Obviously, as we've discussed with my love of books, I'm sort of a sucker for um, hearing authors talk and I never seem to get tired of it, which is sort of shocking even to me. So, uh, <laughs> um, and of course, to support a great cause um, is also wonderful. Well, I don't know what we're doing this year because everything is different this year. Yeah, everything is different everywhere. It's, uh, I'm beginning to think it's just never going back. I've given up. <laughs> I've given up hope. I think Zoom is here to stay, don't you think? And I think I do. podcasts are here to stay and... You know, certain things I think are not going back. It is nice not to have to move around as much throughout the world to see all these different people, which is nice. That's true. the only perk um, <laughs> I found. Um, so a lot of your books have been uh, adapted to movies, film, TV. How does that? How does that process fit into your thinking when you're writing the book? Do you think? It, do you visualize scenes at all, movie-wise? Do you, or is it, or do you not even, does it not even come into your consciousness? Well, you know, the truth is I was a screenwriter for 25 years, some with my own books, but all mostly for other people's books. And um, I think I learned a lot from being a screenwriter and um, I learned a lot about telling a story. Um, but when I'm writing, I don't think of it as a movie. I feel like it's something I'm living. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like I'm in the book. I'm living it. I am the characters. So I don't really think of it as a movie. Like, would this make a good movie? That's not really the way I think about it. And I'm sorry, I did know that because you wrote Independence Day, right? I did. Played yeah. for that, and there was, um, um, yes. Anyway, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I have heard from other authors how critical a skill it is to be able to screenwrite and then turn. To not, I feel like there's so many people who try to who write fiction primarily and they're like, well, now I'm going to try screenwriting. But I think there's something in the reverse that's very powerful. Well, I think it does teach you something about um, telling a story. And it, it's really different. It's really different. They're very different things. But I, I think that um, it, it's, it's, it teaches you to, to know what the heart of your story is. 
Because I think when you're writing a novel, I, I, this happens to me, you can just really get lost and in these kind of offshoots and, and, and tangents, you know, and sometimes they're really interesting, but basically with a screenplay, you know, you're pretty much telling a straight on story and that's helpful, I think. And so which of your many projects are you going to pick up next? Oh, well, I'm, I'm working on the fourth magic book. And, uh, you know, I thought I was finished until I talked to my editor, but it turns out I'm not finished. <laughs> so I have some more work on it. But that's been both really fun and really sad because I feel like it's the last book and it's the end of a 25 year relationship with the Owens family. And so, you know, it's, it's been both things, but it's also been a great escape during this time. That's such a sad, terrible time. Which period of, of the world, like what timeline are you writing that book in? It's, it's modern times. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. How great. Then you can have a whole box set. Sell it, you know, every yeah. Halloween. It could, yeah, they're not all published by the same publisher, so. Oh, so you can't do that? I can't do that. Oh. All of them, yeah. All right. Well, that's okay. You can make your own. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good idea. Little gift bags. I don't know. Um, uh, what advice would you have to aspiring authors? Well, you know, I mean, I really think the best advice is to do it every day. And I used to, my life is like a little complicated right now, but I always would get up really early, you know, before anybody else was awake, before the phone's ringing and work for like at least two hours so that you get that two hours in. So if you get up at 5.30 and start working from six at six or whatever time it is, for me, that always was really helpful. And when I had other jobs, I'd get up, you know, before that other job and, and write then. I feel like if you write every day, it's not so hard to go back to it. And if, if, for me, I always feel like if I stop writing, I'm never going to be able to remember how to do it again. <laughs> so that, you know, that, that's my tip is that, you know, you have to, you have to write in order to write. It's so funny that you've been such a like established literary figure and you still are afraid that if you like take too long a vacation, you'll lose it. <laughs> I, I don't I'm going to lose it. And every time I start a book, I feel like I don't know who wrote the other books. I don't know how they did it. I don't know how to do it. I have to like relearn how do you write a book? <laughs> and how, how do you do it? Do you just, do you get it all out? Like do you ever outline your stories or do you I just? Do. You yeah, just I outline, I make a lot of notes. I do a lot of kind of, what I, what's fun for me is like world building. You know, I, I write down lists of plants and, and, you know, lists of places. And if I'm, you know, writing about the sixties in New York, you know, all the different music clubs and all the different bookstores that were there and, you know, just starting to build the world for the characters to move in. Wow. That's beautiful. I mean, it's amazing that there's a job that allows you to just recreate the universe in which you live every time you open your laptop, right? It's, it's, I know, it's just so. <laughs> it's a good job, but you know, it's, it's kind of like what you do as a reader is that you leave this world behind and you go into a book and, you know, and you escape. And I feel like it's the same thing when you're writing. It's like you, you're creating this other world, you know, using things that you knew, you know, who you are and how you see the world, but it's just creating something brand new. And I know the world has changed so much from when you first went to, to Stanford till now. Is there anything that you miss from the way the publishing industry used to work? Is there anything you long for? Well, when I started, like nobody talked about getting publishing, getting published. Nobody talked about money. It was kind of right after like kind of the Ken Kesey era. You know, it was like, yes, you wanted to write a perfect story or something like that. But you didn't think about, but there were no book tours except for people people like Norman Mailer or something like that, you know, there were no book tours and it, it wasn't about kind of the outside things. It was about the inside, about wanting to be a writer, wanting to tell a story. And I think there's a lot more pressure on people right now. I think it's, it's harder to get published there. You know, the publishing houses are conglomerates and there were a lot more publishing houses. And, but now there are also different options about publishing in different ways online or with small presses. So I don't know, I kind of miss that, that, um, that freedom to just kind of do whatever you wanted to, that it was about what you wanted to write, not about what's publishable. And I think now for people starting out, they have to think about both things. That's true. Sort of the commercialization of even fiction writing. And <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
But I often hear that the best advice is to ignore all of that, as I'm sure you would agree, and just do yeah. what's fun for you and what you need to write or else you can kind of tell when there's no passion in it, right? Absolutely. I mean, you have to have passion, but I think if you want it to be published, you also it also can't be like a diary. Well, right, yeah. I mean, I, I always feel like I'm writing for myself and I'm writing the book for myself, but then it has to be able to all, somebody else has to read it and have it mean what it means to them. And is there anything, any innovations that you've particularly adapted well to that you're like, I love X, Y, or Z? I don't even know why I'm asking you these questions. I love <laughs> I'm just curious. I love Google because if like, I don't know what year something happened in and I'm in the middle of writing, it's like, I don't have to like go through all my books. I can just like find out what year, you know, the Salem, which trials ended, you know, I, I just real quick, you know, it's kind of, it's very helpful. Also, it just took so, you know, when I started, people were typing and it took a long time. Every time you rewrote, you, you know, you rewrote the whole manuscript, really. I think it was kind of good practice, actually, but it just was time consuming. I am old enough that I used to use a typewriter for my school assignments um, <laughs> and have my mother like, you know, help me and have to restart in the whiteout. And oh my gosh, uh, yeah. I'm like, ugh. the idea that you can even produce as clear a thought when there's so much on the line, right? We have to start over again as opposed to now it's like, I'll change that. Right. I don't know. I actually think that's good for writers. And, and I tend to still do that. Like, when you start at the beginning again, instead of just moving things around the way we can do now, it gives a different rhythm, I think. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know, it makes for a different kind of revision. I mean, I think sometimes when I talk to, I'm involved in a, a program for young writers at Adelphi University out on Long Island every summer. And sometimes I think, you know, they really think that writers just write it down and that's it. And, and that's not it at all. I mean, most people have to do lots of revisions and lots of changes and I think that's just a good thing to know when you're starting out, that everybody does it. Yes. Wait for those comments yeah. <laughs> in, in yeah. Google Docs. And then everything, you know, melds together, your love of Google. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, thank you so much. Thanks for chatting with me today. I'm sorry I had some random questions, but I was really curious about sort of like the lifespan of, of being an author for so many different like periods of time and as the industry has changed and you stayed just as current it's um it's really awesome so i don't know it yeah. was a unique vantage point so thanks <laughs> thank thanks for chatting with me today all right thank you all right Take well have care. a great day okay bye, bye, -bye.